Um, and then I did my medical training. So I sort of serve as a, in some ways I sort of see myself as someone that can translate between, uh, or sort of interpret between different disciplines, like biologists have a certain language, uh, math and engineering has a certain language, and medicine has a completely different language. And so that's one of the things that I like to do, sort of integrating all those things together to sort of uh, solve uh, sort of biological and medical problems. And I'm going to tell you about sort of sequencing platforms, uh, sort of the basics of that, and also you know what what are the sort of things that it can do and what are the things it can't do. And I'm going to tell you a story about something that was interesting that um, we found um, in a positive way, and there are other things that uh, I think we have a sort of cautionary tale. And so I showed this picture of like you know this the sky, the night sky, because in many ways sequencing is like this. It's, it's a whole lot of patterns, uh, a whole lot of data, but you, it's really about trying to figure out what is the pattern within all this data that makes sense uh, uh, for biology and human disease. So the things to think about with what we call next generation sequencing, or NGS, is you know, are all sequencers all the same? Can sequencers see different parts of the genome? And uh, the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we care about uh, sort of sequencing quality scores. And if the, the last part, which I, I may not have time for, is thinking about how do we, uh, how, how does things change if we change how the libraries are constructed or normalizing the data uh, from NGS. So, uh, and I want you guys to like, you know, raise your hands and ask questions if any of this doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, I sort of uh, like to sort of have more of an interactive kind of thing. So, th so the first thing is, you know, there are different sequencers. Um, I'm going to show this first sequencer just an illustration of what the basics of sequencing is. But um, this is the Helicos or the SQL uh, sequencing platform. It still does exist. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little later and sort of the, some of the work that I'm, uh, we, we've sort of discovered, some interesting biology. Uh, but basically, sequencing starts with a flow cell. And this is a piece of glass or plastic. Uh, this pointer's not working, but let's see if I can. Uh, some glass or plastic over here. And then on this, there's usually something that's attached directly to the sequencing flow cell. So in this case, it's a bunch of T's or poly T. And this particular sequencer captured RNA because RNA has a poly A tail. And then what you would do is then add reverse transcriptase to create DNA from RNA. And this DNA is shown here in black. And then you would actually digest this RNA uh, and then you create another primer on the other end with a, another enzyme called terminal transferase. Terminal transferase just adds sort of nucleotides at the ends of a single strand of DNA, and you get a poly G. And what happens there is then you can use, uh, so all sequencing requires a primer. You have to have a start of, uh, of uh, the double strand with a primer. So in this case, you use a poly C, which is complementary to the G. And then what basically happens is then at this base here, you can add different bases with different colors. So each of these bases, there's only four, has a different fluorescence color attached to it. And so what would happen is then you actually add an, an A, or in this case it's a G, so cycle one is a G. And on this flow cell, this is a flow cell picture here, in this case this is what we call a single molecule sequencer. So each of these dots is one molecule of DNA. And so that's an insanely difficult thing to image but it's similar to what you guys do if you're an astrophysicist and take telescopes and look deep into space. So as you add a fluorescent G, there's literally a picture acquired. And then the next, and then you quench, and so the fluorescence disappears, and you add a C, fluorescence, take a picture, and then an A, and, and take a picture, then T. And so these sequencers have to do two things. They have to acquire images, they have to know exact positions, and they ha then they have to take all those images and stack them up together to make the A, T, C, and G. And so the reason why I show this is that you can imagine that this process, especially if you're doing it with single molecule sequencing, is probably not the best in terms of error. Like there's a, occasionally it's going to be off, the building's going to shake a little bit, and the sequencing error will increase just because this is an imaging-based technology. Okay, so that is the inherent issue with the standards or sequencers out there. So most of you probably have heard of Illumina. So Illumina um, is sort of the sequencing platform that sort of dominates the field now. 
So back when I started sequencing, there was like four sequencers. Now it's really just Illumina. Um, but the, the, the main thing is Illumina, how it's different is that it, it, it uses that same idea of these little spots on the flow cell. So this is again the sequencing flow cell, or this is actually made of like optical plastic. And what you do is instead of like in trying to image a single molecule, they make these things what we call clusters. And how does this work is, again, on this sequencing flow cell, they have these uh, little adapters here, which are DNA, and they're called P5 or P7. And on your libraries or your pieces of DNA, you actually create, uh, put these adapters on so that when you can hybridize these specific sequencing libraries to either the P5 or the P7. And then through a process called isothermal amplification, they can actually create these clones. And we can go into this in more detail, but they create these clones and you create these things called clusters. So it's the same DNA now replicated in the same area that creates a big spot. And then you do that same thing. You add the fluorescent A, the fluorescent T, or the fluorescent C, or the fluorescent G. Now the reason why this is better than a single molecule sequencer in some ways is that you you don't have to image one molecule now. So the, the, the SQL sequencer weighed about 2,000 pounds. It had this huge piece of granite to keep it stable so it could take pictures of single molecules. But this sequencer, you don't need that. And so that's why ultimately Illumina won the sequencing war was because they were able to sequence faster and cheaper than the other sequencers. And so, but the principle is kind of the same. Does that make sense? And so I, I just put up here the different sequencers, and there's different uh, HiSeq and MySeq sequencers now. But you know, HiSeq is one that can create about 150 to 200 million reads or sequencing uh, uh, calls uh, per lane, and there's about seven lanes that are open. So you can get about 1.4, you know, billion reads potentially from a HiSeq run. Um, and the, these sequencers can run in different, in different patterns. So we don't have to go into all the details today, but uh, certainly I can go into all those sort of uh, finer details later. Question? In the two mode, yeah. So, so this is, uh, so the high seek can run in what we call high output mode or rapid run mode. And so uh, high output mode, the, they were, the Illumina is very smart, high output mode is like creating a lot of data, trying to make as much data as possible. So it takes six days to run. And so a lot of people you know, don't necessarily need 1.4 billion reads. And if they have to wait a week, you know, it, it takes too long. So they created this new format where they can run the machine faster. So it's a 24 hour runtime, but you can only use two out of the sort of 16 lanes. And so the number of reads goes down just because they're, the imaging time is, is compressed. So it's just a, it's just purely, it's purely speed of imaging. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so the way to think about it is like there's this long channel here, and there's like literally something trying to take pictures everywhere. And so to increase their speed from six days to 24 hours, they take less <coughs> fields of view, and because of that, you get less reads. Not because there are less. Uh, you know, actual clusters there. It's just a, it's just purely an imaging thing. So, but we could talk more about that later. So, Illumina also has another sequencer, and this is, I think, important, especially if you deal with people creating data from two different uh, platforms. But it says it's all Illumina. This is the NextSeq. This is a very common benchtop sequencer that people are using. And again, they were trying to create more reads, so 400 million reads, uh, with a quick turnaround time of 24 hours. Uh, and you can run it in high output mode or mid output mode, but basically it's just a 24 hour runtime. And so they were just trying to appeal to sort of consumers, um, but the way that they made it faster was instead of those four colors, so taking a picture with four different colors, uh, they did it with two colors. And so it's either green or red. And so you call a T if it's green, if it's red you call a C, if it's, a, uh, if it's both colors at the same time, it's an A, and if there's no color, it's a G. So this thing is faster because you're only taking two pictures for each cycle, but the error rate is higher because you're relying on a non-color, i.e. G, as, uh, as, as, as being part of the sequencing. Um, and the reason why they chose G is because in general there's less Gs that they're sequencing. Um, that's, that's at least what I've been told. So 
Any questions about that? Right. In what way is it actually possible to distinguish the A is composed by two colors and the yeah. overlap of the two different inside? Right, and that's 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 a great question. And that's basically the error. So there's there's like this known error issue with NextSeq. So the error rate in NextSeq is slightly worse than the uh, the high seq. So this is something to know because you know you think that the A, T, C, and G you're getting in your FASTQ files is is, is like the truth, but in reality, there is a per base error rate. And uh, certainly, I, you know, that Mike, you know, uh, Ben Greenbaum and Raul can sort of comment more on sort of error rates. But um, um, anyway, so those are the, that's the main thing about the Illumina uh, platform. The other sort of platform that I think Illumina bought is called PacBio. Uh, it's it's uh, actually a single molecule sequencer, just like the SQL platform. Uh, it could do extremely long reads, so 110 uh, to 15 KB. The Illumina does about 100 to 300 base pairs in one stretch. So this is a lot longer. Uh, there's no amplification bias because there's no PCR. But the, basically, this works by the same way, except that it actually has the polymerase uh, attached to a what they call a zero mode uh, wave module. And what, what happens there is there's light that is uh, emitted here where it's detecting the fluorescent um, A, T, C, and G again. But what they do is they, they image actual polymerase of, uh, active polymerase of uh, the replication of the DNA. So it's a very interesting platform. <laughs> it's a single molecule sequencing platform and it just sequences this uh, DNA live. Um, and so they, the error rates are fairly high. It's about, you know, I think it's 10 to 11 percent per base. Uh, but what they do to get over this, yeah, question back. Yeah, so the way they get, try, they sort of claim that you can get away with this is that um, you, you can sequence the same strand over and over again. So the chance that you're going to have that same error in that same base twice is, you know, uh, diminished because it's 11% per base error rate. So the chance that you're going to see the same error twice on the same strand is 11% to the second power, right? And third power, fourth power, fifth, maybe. Maybe, I'm just uh, just saying, <laughs> just saying. Um, but it's an interesting sequencing platform because it does something that's different. Question back there. So what's the uh, like temporal resolution of this time machine compared to like, the, the rate at which the, um, the multiple will be? Oh, that's a great question. You know, how, how long it takes to, uh, that's, that's yeah, I don't know. I don't know the the answer to that. I don't know if Ben Ben knows that. What the fact? I don't think I don't think it's not a normal thing that this machine spits out. But theoretically, you're right. It it could it could be able to tell us time in terms of polymerization time. But the machine when when the machine spits out the data, it doesn't have that. But theoretically, it's possible. Um, and so it sort of speak and your sort of question sort of, sort of also speaks to you know other types of sequencing technologies that are out there. IN Torrent is another one. This is produced by uh, owned by Thermo Fisher now, and this is basically detecting proton changes. So it's more of a sort of digital readout. So you add your A and it detects a proton. You add it two T's, then you see two protons. Um, so this is potentially faster. Um, but again, it has some higher error rates. I'm not going to go into deep detail of this because Unfortunately for Thermo Fisher, this uh, sequencing platform is uh, not, not is having difficulty competing with Illumina. And uh, the, the, the last one that I'm going to talk about is the Oxford Nanopore. Um, and I think this is one that um, I think is probably the most interesting. There's still a lot of things that people don't understand exactly how it can be used best. Um, but it basically, there are these little nanopores. And uh, you're trying to look at the change in current across uh, this channel. And as an A, T, C, or G goes through, the amount of resistance that, um, uh, of each of those bases that goes through is slightly different. So you can detect sort of, you know, digitally sort of current changes uh, to sequence. And so this sequencer, in theory, is much faster. You can do 400 bases per second in, uh, uh, with their estimates. Uh, but of course, there's some issues with error, right? So this thing's going by really quickly. Can you really see those differences? There's some errors. But 
they can get extremely long reads. I think I saw a paper where they did two megabases, so two million base pairs in a row. Um, so again, it's a different type of sequencer that can see different things. The other thing that this one, uh, in theory, can do is actually look at the DNA can be modified on its, uh, uh, itself with methylation. And so DNA methylation is a way of epigenetic change. But we think uh, the sequencer can actually create data where you can actually determine DNA methylation you know, directly on the DNA itself uh, without having to do sort of methyl seq. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I remembered like when I was an undergrad, I had a, a colleague, he was a, he was a phys physics uh, major. He, he ended up doing his PhD at Harvard in physics. And he was working on this problem because the physicists had theorized at least he was one of the people working on that to sort of create a sequencer that could sequence the genome like, you know, you know basically a second. Um, and so, uh, so this has now translated like 20 now years uh, to a sequencer that actually looks like it does work. Um, you know, it's very small. Um, it's 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 about this size, and you can actually attach it to your laptop. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a bunch of these these like nanopores, and each of the pieces of DNA will. Yeah, it's an array. Yes, yeah, so it's a very interesting technology, um, and yes, and we we have one. They they have a bigger one that's a little more stable. But the little one, the idea was like you could go like you could go to like you know Kenya and just go sequence some random animals out there. You know you can go to you know you can go to South America and sequence whatever you want down there too. And if you want to go to Mars, you can go sequence stuff out there too. <laughs> Right, so, so the, I think it's a pretty cool device, and the reason why I show this is, the all these devices is to tell you that, you know, we, I think if you ask a bunch of people in in the field like what sequencing you, they're going to say Lumina, but there are other sequencers out there that can do different things, and um, this is just a summary. So the per base error rate for Lumina is about 0.1 percent, so it's not like probably what you guys deal with when you're going out to whatever Arnie says, like seven decimal points, okay? <laughs> so there's, there's a real error rate. It's not perfect. Helicose and SQL, since it's a single molecule sequencer, is a much higher error rate, so five to eight uh, percent error rate. So you really can't use this sequencer well for mutation calls. Ion taurine is about one ten two two percent. And the read length is the other thing that's very different. So, you know, Lumina is about 50 to 30, 300 base pairs in a row. Um, you know, I think honestly, after 100, uh, 120 base pairs, things to start to get um, higher in terms of error rates. Um, and you know, the sort of uh, Oxford nanopore can go up to potentially two uh, million base pairs uh, in a row. Uh, the DNA input is also highly variable across them. So my point in showing this is that you know, there, there's different types of sequencers. They can do different things. You can probably get different types of information. This is something that my lab tends to do a lot of, is like play around with different sequencers. I just got an email yesterday from another sequencing company. It's like, can you play with my toy? I say, yes, I love playing with toys. So, <laughs> um, and so this is just a summary of different applications um, that we can, oh, yeah, go ahead. You mean the. Okay, there's a scatter of points in, in your right. image, right? Right. But I need to find out in a DNA what comes after uh, as a sequence, right? Right. What's, what's in, in contiguous, a contiguous sequence? Yes. Right. No, that's a great question. So that's in Illumina, we have 300 base pairs max, um, um, approximately max, but 100, 150 really on both sides. And then you just align it to what we call reference genome. So you have to have the alignment, and so the you know the previous way they did it was, um, you know they would like sort of shotgun align. So you'd have pieces, and then just keep aligning them, um, and that went so far. And certainly my genome friends here can speak more to that. Um, but there are, if you don't know that reference because you haven't sequenced the entire organism, then you have to do something else. And I'll sort of talk about that on this next slide. So there's two things I'm going to talk about on the next part is really one application is how do you find sort of 
novel RNA splice variants or translocations, so things that you don't know what the contiguous sequence is. And the, that's just going to be a very short sort of illustration. And then I'm going to talk to you about sort of a story of like how we found something that you know we weren't looking for. So, so to your point, so this is an Illumina. This is just theoretical. So let's say you had a gene one and gene two, and they're there's a translocation, so they're not supposed to be fused together. Um, so if you did an Illumina seq, you have like 100 or 100 base pairs on both sides, and about 200 base pairs in the middle. And so you might, you know, read one may may it may land right right at the intersection here, and the read two will end, end up over here. But if you try to align this to the normal genome, it it won't align. Um, and so <laughs> so you would have missed this if you just use a standard aligner. Uh, read two may be like your perfect alignment, where you get one one half of the read, uh, one read is on this side, and the other uh, pair end read is on this side, and you would be lucky to see this like a hundred times. Uh, read three, you would just be on exon one and uh, or gene one, and read four, you'd be on the other one. So this is the limitation of the Illumina: is that if you don't know what the translocation is that you're looking for, you you know you do standard pipeline stuff, you'll miss a lot of stuff. Um, so this is where the PAC bio comes in. You can do a long read for certain RNAs that you're enriching for, and get some, con you know, a contiguous um, sort of sequence. Uh, and then a lot of people are then taking the uh, Illumina data to sort of fill in the gaps here to sort of figure out, you know, because PAC bio has a higher error rate in theory. So this is a way where you combine two sequencers to achieve something. So, you know, some people say, oh, if you went to Mars and had an alien. You'd probably do both of these to figure out what is the consensus sequence, but also sort of use Illumina to sort of get sort of a deeper granularity on sort of the actual calls per base. Yeah, so it's it's basically as you get this is the end of the talk, but as you as you go per base, as you're adding more bases. The um, the quality scores of the error gets worse, and so it's about 120 base pairs. Like sequencing quality gets really bad. It's as you're adding, yeah. It's as, as, as yeah. I think it's I think it's not well. I don't know if you guys know, but it's big. Yeah, it, it's it's as it's incorporating the per it's 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 it's, it's an enzymatic issue. It's it's a. Aren't you at a phase with? I mean, if you're doing number of molecules, you're at a phase if you miss one, and then you miss one and you miss one. And right. The yeah, that's you true. Know, the error rate is higher. Right, right, right. Because you're at a phase from from the base one. Base. base one yeah, one. but we see this with the single molecule sequencers. Right. There's a combination for the, the, yeah, there's a combination. So some of it's just like you, you miss a couple bases and then some of the cluster is off, right? Because it's a clone and not all of them are incorporating at the same time. So, um, but the single molecule sequencer, we have the same problem. Like as you get to base pair, it, yeah, it's, it's basically an a enzymatic issue. Um, and that's, that's what, something that I definitely learned from this uh, Helicos platform. So as you get to base 30, 35, things just don't incorporate well. Um, in the case of the Oxford nanopore, you would not get that problem, right? Right, right, because Oxford nanopore is a different type of sequencing technology. You're just going straight, and there's no incorporation of, of bases. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, they do different things, yeah. This would be RNA, but you could do this on DNA too because it's. Right, so for on DNA, this would be what we call translocation. That's when a, a pure DNA event occurs. But a lot of people are interested in splice variants too, which is this exon intron thing that uh, Arnie was talking about. So this application would be useful for RNA seq or um, DNA seq, depending on the, what you're looking at. Right, yeah, the droplet, the 10x. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I think um, the 10x platform is useful for, um, you know, I mean, the single cell application is one thing, so I could go on and on about that. But, uh, you know, it, there is some, you know, some issues with library construction and droplets in general. It's not um, as efficient as people would want it to be. Um, but I think there are advantages because you could do some of this stuff. You can see what's in trans or in cis, I mean. Um, with that, the sequencing technology. So, so again, like I'm just giving you just a. Uh, this is a pretty good overview of stuff. But there's other sort of tech out there. It's like droplet, uh, droplet sequencing applications, that I'm not going over in, in, in this particular talk because uh, we could be here all day. But we could certainly talk much later uh, about all those things. Um, but I do. I definitely have lots of opinions. Uh, so, so I'm going to tell you a story about like something that you know. Honestly, uh, when, when I was doing my postdoc, I was not looking for, but we saw it because we were using a specific type of sequencer. And so the the, the my postdoc was really I joined Daniel Haver's lab working on circulating tumor cells, or these cells that are in the blood. They're going to metastasize, and we had this cool chip that we could grab these circulating tumor cells and we could do it in my, mouse models and in humans. Uh, and we had a very simple thing we were trying to do. We are going to take these circulating cells that are the progenitors of metastasis, do RNA sequencing, and at the same time, sequence the tumor at the same time. And we decided we had to use a single molecule sequencer at the time because Illumina wasn't doing sequencing of very small amounts of material at that time. This was a long time ago. And so the only sequencer that could deal with like you know, sub-nanograms amounts of material is really this Helicos platform. And so, <laughs> When I started to look at the primary tumor, so this is like the first, like literally day one, Dave Ting pipetted, loaded the sequencer, and it was just a testron. Um, this is what came out of the sequencer. These are the number of usable reads um, for a tumor, normal liver, and a cell line derived from the similar mouse model. And the thing that was strange was that this was normal for the sequencer. About 50 to 60% of the reads aligned to the known transcriptome. And this tumor was only 11%. So I had a couple things. I was like, oh, I just, you know, I'm terrible. I had terrible purification of the RNA. Library construction was wrong. Um, but um, we decided, OK, let's align it to the genome to see if it's you know, not just an artifact or something. And this is where we found that, you know, you know, similarly, it's about 50 or 60 percent for these samples. But in this sample here, we saw 59 percent aligned to the genome, but not to the known transcriptome. So this told us about 50 percent of all the RNA reads coming from this tumor was coming from something in the genome that was not annotated to be an RNA. Um, so we did this thing in biology called BLAST. This is just like takes take some random sequence and just align it to anything in the references. And so, sorry for the picture, but I, you know, it's, uh, it's from a talk. So, so, um, so we bl I blasted this sequence, OK? I'm just telling you how the story evolves. So this is not how it's written in the science paper. This is just how it evolves. <laughs> um, and this is what I get. Then basically, red is perfect alignment, right? So I had all this stuff that's perfectly aligned. I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to find the answer. And this is what came out. It was something on the mouse genome, I was like, OK, it's coming from the mouse. This is all mouse. But then it sort of had 100% uh, alignment to plasmodium. OK, plasmodium is malarium. And these are the three strains of mouse malaria. And then Schistosomiasis mansoni is another parasite uh, that grows in cells in both mouse and human. But you know, this really made me question, like, <laughs> what am I looking at? Um, and so it's an unbelievable thing, right? Three strains of rodenplasmodium. So this is like malaria that only affects mice. So this malaria gets into us from the same mosquito. It does nothing. But in mice, it causes malaria. <laughs> but they have this sequence in their genome. So it really raises the question. And this is all like just on the reference genome. You know, is this just contaminating mouse DNA in these genomes? Maybe that's the easiest conclusion. But the point is, is that it's in the reference, right? So that's, that's what we consider truth. So that's just one cautionary tear. Or is this real? It could be real. And it's highly speculative. Uh, but it didn't make me think, like, maybe there's some relationship between parasites and viruses and cancer. 
And that's sort of a, is a layered talk that I think Ben's going to follow up on. So, um, so anyways, going back to, OK, well, Blast didn't work. I can just give you one, one line anecdote. <laughs> yeah. Contamination of the records is quite possible. Uh, I haven't checked this myself. Yeah. But there were reports that the chimpanzee gene genome is contaminated by tomato. Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or it could be real. Yeah, my, my guess is the lab tech was having tomato sandwiches. <laughs> right. So either the lab tech was playing with mice and, well, I mean, a lot of these malaria, uh, mouse malaria things are grown in mice, obviously. So, so it's, you know, but it's coming from red cells typically. So typically there's no DNA. So anyway, there's all these issues, but contamination is a problem. Um, so, you know, so going back to what is this RNA, so this is, this is what we call the UCSC genome browser, okay? And these are the reads as they were aligning. And this is a really strange thing. All the reads, like 50% of all the reads were aligned to this one part of chromosome 2. And uh, when you looked at reference genes, there was nothing. If you looked at this, this is an ensemble. This is a predicted gene, so it's not even a real gene. And the, the strangest thing is that this sequence had no conservation in any other species um, other than malaria. And so it was like really irritating. Um, <laughs> as a postdoc, because uh, Daniel Haver is like, just keep looking. And I kept looking, and I couldn't see anything. Um, but it was actually this thing at the very bottom that it, everything was piling up on after I stared at this long enough. And it was this thing called Repeat Masker. And Repeat Masker was designed to remove junk DNA from sequencing, because this stuff has to be junk. And that was sort of the dogma. So all these reads were, were being filtered out by our sequencing platforms because it was saying it was junk. Now, what is the major satellite repeat, which is all lined up to be, is that the major satellite repeat in the mouse makes up 3% of the entire mouse genome. It is in the pericentromere, so the thing right next to the centromere. Um, and so it's a large piece of structural parts of the genome. Um, it's important for the kinetic core complex for um, the faithful segregation of chromosomes. Okay, so this junk, which makes up a huge part of the genome, is being expressed at some extraordinary amount in, in that initial sample. And the only reason why we saw this with the, with the sequencing platform is repetitive elements, which I you know, uh, sort of went through quickly in the beginning. Um, you, know, you can't PCR, it's so repetitive that when you PCR, it's like different sizes. So you can never create cluster formation in Illumina. So this is part of the genome, the centromere or the middle, that Illumina cannot see very well. And that's why if you looked in all the Illumina data, you do not see it. But in the single molecule sequencing platform, which is not PCR dependent, you can see we saw this. And this is the only reason why we saw this. And so then we looked at other mouse tumors, so genetically engineered mouse tumors, so the ones that are KRAS or P3 mutate or KRAS SMAD4 or colon or lung, it was at high levels in all of them. And in cell lines, which I'll talk about later, we didn't see as much. But in normal tissues, we also didn't see as much. But if you look at this first tumor, this is five, about almost 500,000 reads per million. I mean, it's half the RNA from this initial tumor I sequence was this one repeat. And on average, it was 10% of all the RNA annotatable in the genome um, in the mouse. So an extraordinary amount of transcription occurring from the junk. Um, and so, you know, as a biologist, you have to like prove that you actually do see this in some other format other than this uh, sort of, uh, you know, magical machine we had. So we did northern blot. So northern blot is you run, uh, you purify RNA, run it on a gel, and then you probe it with an, with an RNA probe and then you could visualize. So the couple things we learned is the tumor over here, uh, it's a smear, so it's not just one band. It's not like one gene. It's multiple genes or it's RNA uh, processing. And the other thing that we learned was that if you take this tumor and put it, made a cell line and put it on plastic, it all went away. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about this phenomenon, but it's an interesting phenomenon. And if you treat it with azacitin, which is an epigenetic drug that releases these things, you see it come back out, so indicating that some of it's epigenetically related. If you take that same cell line and stick it back in a mouse and make a tumor again, it comes back. So there's something about growing on plastic that like makes this thing disappear, which is another interesting fascinoma. 
And then we developed a way to visualize it in tissue. This is RNA in situ hybridization. So this is an RNA probe specific against the uh, satellite repeat that then we can visualize with, uh, with the stain. And so in this case, the major satellite repeat is in blue. We see the primary tumor is very high, normal pancreas, proteins like nothing. And we saw it in metastases from these mice and their livers. But probably the most interesting thing is these mice are genetically engineered to develop pancreas cancer. So we can actually look at how early does this happen. And the pancreas cancer, so P PDAC is pancreas cancer, uh, in what we call low-grade panning, or the beginning of pancreatic cancer, not cancer yet, called the preneoplastic lesion, we start to see expression of the satellite repeat. And it gets higher as it gets to high-grade panning. This suggests that this defect is a very early event in tumor genesis, certainly in mouse models, and we've replicated this across all the other different cancers. Um, so the summary is like, looking at the junk may be a fruitful exercise. I think Greenbaum will tell us more about junk uh, in his talk. Um, <laughs> um, he, ben loves junk. Um, mass. I don't know. So we put in the supplemental text of the paper because we're like, well, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, just put in the supplemental text and maybe someone will figure it out. We don't know. We don't know. Like, so what, so there's a period of time where like we were going crazy. It's like maybe, maybe malaria and a virus got together and then like and put it into the genome, but then it made no sense. Like. Why would most of the genome be made of this random malaria virus thing? So then it turned into, it must, start, it must have started in the, in the species, and then malaria takes it out, and so do maybe potential viruses, and use it for potential co-opting replication in, in the cell somehow, right? Because the, the strange thing about malaria, right, is that the same mosquito that carries human malaria carries mouse malaria. But mouse malaria only causes malaria in mice, and human malaria only causes malaria in humans. But it's carried by the same vector. How is there species specificity for the different parasites? Maybe it's this. I don't know. Is it something like a, a <laughs> retrotransposon? Right. It could have been in the parasite as well as the mouse. Right. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, we were going through this crazy period of time where we were thinking this. Actually, I, I think I do. I put in these slides that sort of speak to this, this retrotransposon thing. So this is like new slides I threw in. So just bear with me because I, I I don't really talk about this much. So this is that uh, UCSC genome browser thing again, and um, um, this is the major cell I repeat. So we notice like, okay, this is like not in the centromere or the pericentromere. This particular thing. That's why all these reads lined up here. But when we did whole genome alignments, we realized there's a lot of reads occurring um, in the centromere too. So this is just a multiple alignment issue. But why did this piece of the major satellite, which normally is in the centromere, is out in the middle of the coding parts of the genome? And we found out right next to it was the line one element. And I'll talk about what the line one element is in a second. But um, we found that line one, which is another repeat, which is in the <laughs> euchromatin, uh, so it was linear correlated with the satellite repeat in terms of expression across m multiple tissue types in the, in the mouse. Uh, this is just expression, just, just expression in the same samples. Um, and so they're, they're somehow linked. The repeats, at least in the mouse, were highly linked. And the line one is actually a, what we call a retrotransposon. So it actually uh, makes up about 20% of the genome. It's, uh, it has two parts that are protein coding. Uh, so there's about 100 protein coding line ones in the human genome. Um, ORF1 is a uh, ribonucleotide protein, so it binds its own RNA. Uh, ORF2 over reframe 2 is actually an endonuclease and a reverse transcriptase. So the endonuclease actually causes a double strand break in the DNA. And the reverse, trans uh, reverse transcriptase takes its own RNA, makes it into DNA, and then inserts itself in the genome. So the sign element, or the ALU element, is replicated through the human genome through line one. Um, and this suggested, this mouse suggested that line one, at one point, stuck this major satellite repeat in this funny part of the chromosome, which it normally doesn't live in. Now, we try to prove that by making a PCR against this one insertion here. Um, and we wanted to look in mice and try to understand. So this is just a, a map of you know how did the mouse 
sort of uh, evolve uh, over time in different locations. And so Mouse spreedus is like over here in sort of uh, north West Africa and Spain. Um, and Castanius is, uh, is over here in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but the uh, laboratory mouse is, uh, is really is a mixture of different mice, um, but it's mostly m uh, Muscus domesticus. And this PCR we designed was was we wanted to look in multiple mouse species. Uh, and domesticus and, and uh, Castanius sort of separated maybe you know over half a million years ago or so. And so. You know, how did these laboratory mice happen? I, I don't know all the details of this, but this is what I could figure out from uh, uh, searching of things, is that these, they, there probably was a common source for all the laboratory mice, uh, and they just ended up in different people's labs and countries. Um, and so this is just to show that these are three major laboratory mice that came uh, from different sources, but potentially came from a common source at some point a long time ago, um, probably from this English fanciers people. And so we did this PCR, and this is the control, this 958 base pair insertion of the satellite. And if you look here, all the laboratory mice have it in their genome. But mouse spreedus, which is that wild mouse that lives in Spain, does not have it. And Castanius doesn't have it either. So this insertion in that funny part in chromosome 2 happened sometime uh, in mouse evolution, or not evolution, but you know, sort of speciation and divergence somewhere at least 500,000 to potentially 300 years ago. The point of showing this is that this phenomenon that we saw um, is indicative of what happened in a laboratory mouse, but these things can replicate themselves um, in the genome and have, have done so from the beginning of, of the species. So I'm not going to get into all this, but they can replicate through reverse transcription similar to retroviruses. Germline genomes evolve through this restored transposition and tumors most certainly are probably utilizing this process as a parallel strategy to evolve genomes rapidly distinct from mutation. So I think that this is a very large driving force of sort of what we call evolution. Um, so that was all in the mouse. So what about humans? Remember, zero sequence homology between mouse and human. So this is looking at uh, all satellites in the human. So this is cancer, normal pancreas, lung cancer, kidney cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, prostate cancer and some other normal tissues. And so we see that some satellites are, uh, our satellites as a whole are seen in uh, different uh, cancers, but also in some normal tissues. Uh, when we started looking at human satellites, mouse has two satellites, humans have 25 different satellites. We saw that there's one satellite, HSAT2, that was very different than the others. It was 131 fold higher in cancer compared to normal. So cancer uh, enriched in black and normal tissues and, and white. And so this really told us, it's like, even in the mouse, there's only two, and the human, there's a, a different types. So different satellites seem to be expressed in different types of tissues. And when we looked in the cancers again, it was pretty much in every pancreatic cancer, there's zero in normal pancreas. There was in lung, kidney, ovarian, and prostate cancer, and pretty much absent in all normal tissues. And so this is a very strange satellite. So it's not like just all the satellites. Uh, and on average, is about 2,500 reads per million. So the same sequencing platform, GAPDH, was a very common housekeeping gene. is about 300. You're talking about something that's like tenfold higher than a housekeeping gene and highly specific for cancer um, and concordant with uh, the same um, sort of uh, species that you see in the mouse, but completely different in terms of sequence composition. We developed RNA in situ and validated that you do see this in pancreas cancer patients. And again, we see it at PANIN. So at the very beginning of human tumor development, we see H2 uh, uh, dysregulation. And so the, the point in showing that is really to sort of say human and mouse elements have no sequence homology for these repeats. They're none. Um, but they're in the same sort of positions on the chromosomes, in the centromeres and the telomeres, uh, not the telomeres are shared, but centromeres and the sort of uh, line one elements. And these aberrant expression of the repeat RNAs are really shared between if you have a mouse tumor, you express mouse repeats, and if you're a human tumor, you express human repeats. And in humans, some repeats are different. They're specific to cancer like HSAT2, and again, Ben Greenbaum will, I think, expand upon this in his talk. So the last part, I don't know how much time, I, uh, the last part of the talk, I'm just going to talk about sequencing quality a little bit, and I'll just want to take questions after that. Um, so this is sort of what we were talking about. So this is the beginning of the read. And this is the end of the read. Um, and this is uh, 
what we call a, a FRED quality score. So above 30 is what you would want, um, which is a base call accuracy of 99.9%. .9%. So typically, if you're in the green, you're good. But you can see here, this is from base 1 to, I think this is, yeah, this is 100. So this one um, sample, you, know, you have pretty good sequence quality across the whole sample. This sample, you know, around base 75, we started seeing some sequence issues. And so this is a problem that's known, um, is that as the sequencing goes on, there's differences in error rates that occur. And so you can't assume that all your A, T, Cs, and Gs across the entire strand. This is Illumina. Yeah. So the, I show this because this is, this, is a, this is truth. You see variation. And this is actually, uh, and it's much worse when you do single cell RNA-seq. So I won't go into all that, but, um, but it just tells you like you have to be careful. Uh, and this is important, especially if you're going to call single nucleotide variants or mutations. Uh, so this is why people talk about depth. Like I want to see it like 100, 1,000 times at the same location. Um, and poor, poor sequencing at the ends of the reads, at least some people do, what they do is they just chop reads chop the last 20 base pairs if they start seeing this as a systemic issue. Um, and those are things that you can do. You know, you just fix that. Um, but there's some times when, you know, these things go sort of missed. Not intentionally, but they just are. And I'm just going to give you an example of one of these that I thought was an interesting paper, and I, there is truth to it, and, but there are some issues with things. So there's this idea of RNA editing. So, you know, Arnie had talked about, you know, the DNA is, is the the template, the RNA comes out, um, and the RNA is reflecting the DNA, but there's enzymes that can process those RNAs to sort of alter those RNAs. And so there's an investigator that looked at RNA and DNA differences. So they did RNA-seq and DNA-seq on the same samples, and they said, okay, I want to see all the differences between the RNA and DNA in the same samples. And they made these calls, like thousands of A to G events, T to C events. Um, just showing that this was like an endemic situation. Like this is a huge thing that can occur, is RNA-DNA differences. So RNA editing was a significant thing. And they even showed, and I think that there, you know, th I think there's certainly truth to RNA-DNA events, that these can be protein coding. So even though it's not encoded in your DNA, you can actually create a RNA event that leads to a protein that's different. And that's what they showed in this nice science paper. However, a year later, there are three independent groups that reanalyze this paper. And, so, and I'm not really saying that RNA-DNA events don't happen, but that what they found is that it probably doesn't happen as frequently as people had thought. And it was basically, these are the sequence reads, and you can sort of see they're all at the ends. So most, a lot of these calls that they were making were at the end of the sequencing read. And so a lot of these RNA-DNA events were, in fact, sequencing error events. And so it's not, again, it was not intentional. I don't think they were like, intentionally trying to enrich their RNA-DNA events. But this just, just tells you that there are technical artifacts within the data that can lead to false positives. Um, and so there are additional reasons to have caution. And this is why um, you know, mutation uh, detection pipelines um, are sometimes um, difficult is there's this paper in Nature Communications that uh, really shows like this is like you're different, uh, using different pipelines with aligners and um, sort of uh, mutation callers. And what you can see here is over here in the true positives and the false positives, if you take the same data and do different combinations of these pipelines, you get very different answers. Um, and so, I show this because, you know, you can have some extraordinarily high false positive rates just by putting in the wrong sequence of how you align data and call mutations. And so this is really just, huh? Right, right. So they'll call they'll call um, mutations differently. Yeah, yeah. So the same data just put through different pipelines, and then, you know, you, you know, if you take this one up uh, at the at the top as the gold standard, right? 
the uh, true positives is this many and the false positives, you know, and you compare it to other ways of aligning the data, so aligning into the genome, and then you do different ways of um, mutation detection, you get different answers. And so this is, uh, I don't know how these guys have figured out how to deal with this, but it's a problem. It's like a problem. It's a systemic problem, but it's something to be aware of because, again, like the mutation, the error rates of the sequencing are not small. Um, and so this is, you know, where, you know, I think, you know, you have to be aware of these things. And of course, you know, you, most of the time my computational colleagues I work with want more data and they were like, oh, I, you know, I want the sequence like, you know, a thousand fold. Um, and I need a 10,000 samples. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I would do that for you if I had $100 million, but I don't. So, <laughs> uh, um, you know, so I think like these are just things to be aware of, but also that there's realistics, uh, realistic issues of cost. Um, and, uh, and clinical samples are sometimes not so abundant. Um, so those are the challenges I think the field has is materials, cost of sequencing as you try to create more data, but the real issue is like error rates are, are different. Um, what, what's the data set that you use? I, you know, I can't, I don't remember exactly um, which data set, do you remember? It, yeah. It's just some reference genomes that people have used, but the point is like you could do these different taking the same data and pushing it through different pipelines creates different issues. Um, so I just put this up there as just like, you know, the, the big summary points are, you know, there are different types of sequencers, so consider what is your question being answered before you choose what type of sequencing you do. Just don't like sequence Illumina and just don't ask the core to sequence something because the, the core can sequence different types of ways. I didn't go into library construction just for the interest of time, but you can create different libraries and they have different uh, things that they can see or don't see. Uh, and that's all at the molecular level. Um, confirmation of sequencing findings through you know, target assay is very important. So you can't just believe and just, if I just do a lot of things with my sequencing data, that's the truth. It's, you should have someone try to validate that that's a true th thing in some other way. And I always tell this to my postdocs is like, you know, sequencing provides you all this data but you, you know, if you don't have any questions, you'll just get lost in the data, and then it's just like making data for the sake of making data. Um, and if you don't look at the data, <laughs> you know, you can see problems sometimes. So, you know, I've had people sometimes they'll do this analysis and they'll have this spreadsheet of like all these false discovery rates and all these genes, and I say, let's just show me the heat map. Show me that it's, you know, does it look right? And then when they show it, it's like doesn't look right. It's like <laughs> there's no way that that's right. So you have to really just look at the data, um, visualize it, and see if it makes sense with something. If it doesn't, then there may be something buggy with the code. Um, and I'm not going to go into considering the things for a sequencing library because I think I'm done with time. Is that right? Am I? I don't know. Any other? Well, why don't I just take some questions now? We could just sort of see how things. You were saying that the error of the sequencing get worse for the sequencing themselves. Can you elaborate why it's worse? Yeah, so typically the um, single cell RNA seq, um, you get a lot of higher errors because the RNA quality is typically worse, we think. We don't exactly know why, you know, because it's hard to. There's no gold standard for single cell RNA-seq. But there are a couple things that we know. So if you, so, you know, I've done single cell RNA-seq initially when we would pick a cell by hand with a micromanipulator and stick it in a PCR tube um, and sequence it. And then at the same time, if you do a fax sorter, which is like, you know, just sort of shooting the cells into individual wells. And if you take the same samples and do it, and sequence, you will see more genes with that hand-picked approach than the flow sorter approach. And so in single cell data, there's, you know, there's error rates, but there's also um, inability to see, see stuff. So you know, it's basically dropout. So in the single cell data where I picked, we could see on average like seven to 10,000 genes uh, in a single cell. But in the flow sorted ones, you would only see 3,000. And in the 10x, Maybe it's a thousand, and so when you see a zero, 
for a gene, you don't actually know if it's zero because you just can't see it. Yeah. Oh yeah, the C, yeah. So there, there's some reason why. So if I did the single cell, there's some reason that the you know the sequencing quality goes down. I don't. I think it's just a library construction thing. I don't have a good reason. It's just all empiric. Um, is that when I take if I take like if I take RNA from like um, you know bulk RNA and then dilute it down to 10 picograms and sequence it, and then if I take a single cell which is about 10 picograms and sequence it the error rates at the end of the sequencing is always a little worse for the single cells than the bulk RNA. And I think it's just the <laughs> RNA quality issue when during library construction. But um, it's hard to you know, prove. There's no clear clinical reason. So we can, I can only speculate it's RNA quality of a single cell versus purified high quality RNA that you dilute down. But if you take you know, the theoretical amounts of the same RNA quantity from purified RNA that's high quality versus a single cell that you're doing the best you can, there's, there's a difference. And it definitely gets worse as you are more harsh on single cells. So for some reason, like droplet, the droplet uh, 10x data is pretty sparse in terms of number of genes you can see. And I think a lot of it has to do with these issues. So a lot of people are into single, single cell RNA-seq right now because you're like producing all this data but you're, all, you're getting very shallow information for the most part. Um, my original work has been, uh, I didn't talk about the single cells, has really been, I you know, had to pick a single cell, stick it in a tube, you, you just see more. It's much more labor intensive and I'm not gonna do that on 10,000 single cells, but you know, I did it on hundreds. Um, and so you just get different types of information. But again, it's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what? You mean on the ten x? Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's definitely part of it. Ten x is is is. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean most. I mean almost all the sort of standard RNA seq is is single-stranded RNA because you're doing cDNA. Uh, again, this is, comes into, uh, you know, library construction is very important. Like, the repeat RNAs are double-stranded a lot of times. So you can't do standard mRNA-seq. And this is what a paper that uh, Ben published. Like, if you do mRNA-seq, it's oligo-DT based. So you're only seeing a single-stranded uh, RNA that has a poly-A tail. So again, it's, you know, it's sort of like, library construction. So this, this is single cell RNA-seq protocol here. It's very basic, but basically oligo-DD paste, you make cDNA, um, you have a universal primer one on this side. Uh, you do that same terminal transferase, put a bunch of A's, put a bunch of T's here with a universal primer two primer and go the other way. Um, but you know, the main issue here is you're biased to the three prime side of the mRNA and you have to have a poly A tail. Okay, so the single cell RNA-C can't really see non polyadenylated species that well. Um, and this is the true seq or sort of stranded RNA, total RNA-seq is um, you basically do random hexamers uh, and you can sort of um, identify coding and non-coding parts of the, uh, RNA, but you use uh, uh, capture probes to get rid of ribosomal RNA. And so I show this just to say that this is not perfect either, right? You're trying to remove a large species and then sequence. And so sometimes people forget that you have to remove ribosomal RNA counts from your RNA-seq data because that's what you were trying to do here. So you'll get variable efficiencies of ribosomal RNA depletion in, in these protocols. Uh, but this is not poly-A dependent and um, uh, these different sort of biases can occur at, if you do an oligo DT base versus random primers. Amplification is obviously another bias that we just talked about on a fragmentation size. So, um, and all these things have issues later with like normalization of data. Like if you're a, if you're only looking at mRNA, how do you normalize it, right? You just normalize it to all the other mRNAs. If you're doing total RNA seq, how do you normalize it? Do you normalize it to mRNAs? Um, all the RNAs, 
but you're missing the ribosome RNAs. Like, we don't actually know how best to normalize things. It's kind of like people just sort of make it up as they go. But you do your best you can, you know. So for like mRNA seq, you just normalize the total mRNA reads. So that assumes that every cell has the same amount of mRNA. But we know that that's probably not true, right? Like each cell probably has different levels of mRNA, but that's how we normalize the data. Um, and so the non-coding has a more severe problem because you have all these mRNAs, which make up a small portion of the total RNAs. And then you have all these non-coding RNAs. Do you add them together? And what about the ribosomal RNAs and the mitochondrial RNAs that you depleted? You know, those are variable too. You know, there's pretty clear evidence that cancers have more ribosomal RNA than, than normal cells in general. So is that biologically relevant? Probably. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, That's right. Um, but if you had used Illumina where you would lose that information through the PCR amplification, what would that data set look like then? You, I wouldn't see it. I just wouldn't see it. You just wouldn't see it. And that's, that was the funny thing. I mean, if you look, if you look deeply for it, then um, you can find it. But the, you don't see as much as you would from the single molecule sequencer because the sequencer just can't see it as well. So, uh, Ben, you're going to talk about that, right? Uh, not. <coughs> not exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so like total RNA. So most of TCGA and ICGC is huge databases. It's all mRNA seq. All mRNA seq. So you're only seeing polyadenylated RNA. And so if you look for these repeats in there, you don't see a lot of the repeats. Now, there's some that had total RNA seq done, and then when you look there, you can't see it. And if you were to do the helicose, you would even see more of it because of just the ability to, to detect. And that's what it really comes down to is, is my machine detecting something that other machines cannot detect? Uh, and the second thing is, was the library construction done in a way to see stuff that's not like stuff I'm trying to look for specifically? Does that make sense? Yeah. What do they do? You, you said it's related to like a theoretic, but like, have you done experiment where you like cut it out and you know, yeah. show them and see what happens? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so, um, so what do the satellites do? I don't have it in the slide deck. So satellite RNAs, um, we had shown that they are replicating into the line ones through a rever reverse transcriptional process. And the satellite RNAs seem to reincorporate back into the centromeric regions. When you have more of those satellite copies, at least based on TCGA whole genome data, you do worse as a patient. So there's a linkage with worsened outcomes in patients of satellite replication. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that chromosomes are not segregating properly? Does that I mean that since it's in the center, right. yeah. it probably has something to do with getting on to the... So we, yeah. So we don't know exactly, but we think it's actually the opposite. It, we think that larger pericentromeres allow you to tolerate replication stress better because you're just a physically larger thing. So when we started looking at cell lines that we kept um, growing in mice, their centromeres would get bigger in the satellites because if you take the same cell lines and grow in plastic, the satellite RNAs are not expressed. But in the mice, they, they are. And so they keep growing. And as we saw the tumors and they were growing, there was increasing um, DNA damage based on gamma H2AX staining, but the tumors were still surviving. So we think it's a way to survive replication stress and DNA damage. Is the mutation rate or the generating mutation rate? Well, it's yeah. DNA damage is right. So it's, it, it increases the ability to tolerate genomic stress, I think. Yeah. And also the centromeres are bigger. So what does that mean? Does that mean they? You know, you can tolerate aneuploidy a little better. I don't know. But what we do know from Inderverma's paper, which came out after m mine. What kind of genomic stress is chemotherapy? For right. Example. So th is it, is it yeah. the case that these cells are more resistant to chemotherapy than cells grown in plastic? 
uh, are the cells. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, so chemotherapy, so one thing we've done is like if you treat cell lines with chemotherapy and you look, the repeats go high. So it's like, there's a, it's like, is it a stress response? And they're trying to adapt, potentially. Now, if we looked at patients that were pre-treated with heavy chemotherapy and radiation and look at their tumors, they clearly have higher repeat RNAs than untreated ones. It's a, all association. Um, we, we think it is, but it's, you know, it's harder to. It's not entirely clear when you've got selection in the tumor. In other words, more satellites you grow quicker. Yeah. Or perhaps that there's a, sat there's a satellite replication inhibit function in normal cells that's trying to prevent the satellite from replicating. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a secondary effect. Yes. The tumor has damaged the, uh, yeah. the, the inhibiting mechanism, and now the thing just takes off. And it's not really a selection exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, it definitely happens early. The initial. Yeah. So it's it's similar to like, to, you know, in some ways we, you know, this is a harder concept, but we think that the satellites in in many ways is part of our innate immune response. You know, they're repetitive elements. They look like viruses, and when your cells are stressed, they they get released, and it's a signal to your your innate immune sensor. So these are these sensors that detect foreign RNA and DNA in your cells. And when they see that normally from viruses, the, the operation is activate interferon and kill yourself. Kill yourself to save the organism. Um, and so these repeats, which you know, you know, Ben's, Ben had a nice paper showing this, uh, and we've been working on this together, um, activate those same sensors. And so in some ways, early in early tumor genesis, when these repeats are released, they serve as a way for uh, immune surveillance. They serve as a way as like, you know, in good cough, and uh, there's a good, um, this uh, PI, good cough had shown this paper in PNS a, a few years ago. You can release these repeats in the setting of P53 loss, and that initiates a, a, death, a death cascade. So you kill yourself because something is wrong with you. But, you know, somehow cancers have a- But they oddly are positive selection for reproduction of the host. And they are activated, right? And they also are are high in embryogenesis. That's the only other time we see high levels of repeat RNAs. And so I always come back to, well, why would you produce so many of these things in embryogenesis if it was just a side effect? It's probably doing something. So we're still trying to figure out the function. Um, Inder Verma had a couple papers showing that BRCA BRCA1, which is a key tumor suppressor, seems to be his contention. His contention, his group's contention, is that BRCA1's true function is to suppress satellite repeats. It's not homologous DNA repair, and that's obviously met with a lot of resistance from the BRCA community. Um, um, prevent their transcription, and he's arguing. Their initial papers had argued that the satellite RNA uh, is potentially causal for sort of chromosomal instability, which is also highly contentious, which may be favorable for a cancer to have, is some level of chromosomal instability. Certainly we know if you create too much chromosomal instability in a cancer, it will die, right? That's what chemotherapy does. But, you know, having a little bit of chromosomal instability is clearly good for cancers because that is always linked with badness in, in patients. If you are more aneuploid, you just do worse no matter what we do. Chemotherapy, targeted therapy, it doesn't really matter. So. Thank you.